You know, I started uh, when I was uh, a kid, and I realized looking back now that even though I was kind of tapped on the shoulder like a lot of people because I could memorize uh, scholastic information and regurgitate it back on tests, so I got tapped and said, well, you know, you can be, do anything you want to. You know, you could be an engineer or a doctor, a lawyer, CPA, you know, something in the sciences more, more or less. And, and yet I remember looking back that I was very entrepreneurial at a young age. Um, I was the one who was uh, kind of initiating or catalyzing uh, the kids in the neighborhood to, to find out ways uh, to, that I could make money. I didn't, you know, wasn't always so good about, about paying it forward. <laughs> they just kind of volunteered, right? But, you know, kind of the, the paper route thing uh, and, and mowing lawns and getting the other kids to get their dad's lawnmowers. And, you know, I, I always wanted to make money. Uh, and, and I look back now and I realize it wasn't because I, I had needs in my family. My, our family was not well to do, but well enough. So didn't have to really worry about where food was going to come from or, or clothing. We were, we, were, we were blessed in that regard. But I still realize now that what I wanted was independence. Mm. Uh, not to leave home. I wasn't ready to head out, you know, at 12 or 13 years, but I just wanted my own independence. And what's that mean for, you know, a, a, a kid, a boy at that age? Well, it means having a good bike because on a bike, you can go anywhere. Welcome to Corporate Caffeine. Today, Kyle and I welcome David Phelps, the founder of Freedom Founders. Now, David's family went through a very traumatic experience a number of years ago, and it caused him to question the definition of success and what's it all about. The answers that he came up with changed how he was able to be there for his family, changed his career, and eventually helped him found an organization that would change the financial trajectory of other professionals. He helps people build wealth beyond the typical rules that we've all been taught. You are gonna love David's energy. You are going to be fascinated and surprised by his story, and you need to listen to his advice and his way of thinking. Let's go ahead and dive in. David Phelps, I am so excited to have you on Corporate Caffeine. Welcome to the show. Uh, Daisy, it's an absolute pleasure. So glad to be here also. I tell you what, we were teasing off camera, but honestly, I'm a little like, ha ha, now I get to ask you anything I want. <laughs> so this is going to be super, super fun. Yeah, well, now that Kyle has me strapped in here, you know, with like like multiple bands around this chair, I guess I'm not going anywhere. So I'm, I'm good to go for the <laughs> That's duration. That's our plan. We're yeah. going to get every bit of information out of you we can. Yes. Yeah. I mean, so for the audience's sake, I mean, of course they can see your bio, but I mean, we're going to be diving into wealth and success and pivoting in your career, your interesting story, and then whatever other squirrels decide to run across our path in the midst of this. And so I am super excited. I think though, why don't I just ask you, would you mind telling everybody your story, you know, like how you came about, you know, founding Freedom Founders and the journey that brought you here, your aha moments and what's led you here? You know, I started uh, when I was uh, a kid, and I realized looking back now that even though I was kind of tapped on the shoulder like a lot of people because I could memorize uh, scholastic information and regurgitate it back on tests, so I got tapped and said, well, you know, you can be, do anything you want to. You know, you could be an engineer, or a doctor, or a lawyer, CPA, you know, something in the sciences more, more or less. And, and yet I remember looking back that I was very entrepreneurial at a young age. Um, I was the one who was uh, kind of initiating or catalyzing uh, the kids in the neighborhood to, to find out ways uh, to, that I could make money. I didn't, you know, wasn't always so good about, about paying it forward. <laughs> they just kind of volunteered, right? But, you know, kind of the, the paper route thing uh, and, and mowing lawns and getting the other kids to get their dad's lawnmowers. And, you know, I, I always wanted to make money. Uh, and, and I look back now and I realize it wasn't because I, I had needs in my family. My, our family was not well to do, but well enough. So didn't have to really worry about where food was going to come from or, or clothing. We were, we, were, we were blessed in that regard. But I still realize now that what I wanted was independence, mm. uh, not to leave home. I wasn't ready to head out, you know, at 12 or 13 years, but I just wanted my own independence. And what's that mean for, you know, a, a, a kid, a boy at that age? Well, it means having a good bike. Because on a bike, you can go anywhere, yeah. and right? And then so, so, but I didn't want the hand-me-down bike because you know, my parents, thankfully, they did not give myself and my sisters, you know, d you know the best. Uh, it was always, you know, uh, secondhand, work for it. Yep. And so I'm glad for that. But I wanted, I wanted better. So uh, I, I had to earn money to have that. And I, I wanted 
By the way, I also uh, got tired of watching uh, Family Night and Disney, you know, on the one TV set uh, in the home. So I wanted my own TV set, yeah. black and white, yes. right? but still it was my own. So <laughs> right. I could like, watch like, Monday Night Football and the stuff that I wanted to watch as a kid. Anyway, so going forward, but I, I still went on uh, into academia and went into uh, dentistry, uh, dental school. But before I got into dental school, I was reading all the coursework that I had to, to, to get ready to, to graduate college. And, and I still wanted to learn more about, well, you know, how, how can you be a good investor? I was kind of, I think I was just kind of like curious about what's an investor. And so I started reading books about, about investors and what does that mean? And kind of read books about the stock market and, you know, mutual funds and that kind of thing that were just coming on board back in the seventies. And then I found a few books about real estate and I compared and contrasted the two. And I thought, you know, real estate, I can, I can understand this. It's tangible. Uh, I understand what a house is. We live in a house. And so reading some of those books about how you could you know, buy undervalued properties and you can fix them up and you can rent them or sell them. See, this has been going on for a long time. You know, it's now, it's kind of the rage today because it's on TV and you know, flip this house. Yes. But yeah. we didn't have any of that back then. It's just, I had books, right? I had to go to the library to get these books. Uh, um, Amazon was not delivering back you? then. Nope, nope, nope. nope. No and, uh, Google. And there was no <laughs> Google there. Exactly. No, no online forums, nothing. So anyway, but so I, when I was um, going to dental school um, the next year, I told my dad, I said, hey, dad, you know, what? I'm going to be here four years and, uh, you know, we should uh, invest in a property. Uh, we should because I, you know, I didn't have the capital. I didn't right. make money, uh, but I had the, the drive initiative. And so fortunately, he agreed. He put up the, the financing and the down payment. And we found a house uh, in, in, in Dallas where I was going to school in a good neighborhood and the but it was the worst house in the neighborhood it was an estate sale a lady a widow lady had, had finally had sold it in her estate sold it so made a good purchase and fixed it up and i was the manager and we took it to my graduation point and i put it on the market to sell it we split about fifty thousand dollars in capital gain profits nice uh, that's a nice little graduation yeah. gift well, to yourself that's, yeah. not, that's, not, that's 1983 yeah. huge so almost yeah what uh for almost 40 years ago. Yeah. And so I, I, and then I saw it, then I kind of compared and contrasted this $25,000 that I received in profit from this one property and look back to all the evenings and weekends where I waited tables all through college and dental school and thought, even though I made pretty good money in tips, I look back and go, the number of hours I put in to get that money versus the hours I put in to receive this profit in this real estate there was no comparison. It's probably a 10x. Yes. Right? Probably a 10x. And that was where the um, you know the lights really flashed. And so I went on after graduation. I was you know got into a dental practice uh, as an associate, and I was still very intrigued with both dentistry and real estate. Fortunately, uh, no children at that point. That was a key. Um, and so I kind of ran two things in tandem. You know, by day I was a, a dentist learning that that trade, and uh, evenings and weekends I was doing this real estate stuff. And and my, my, and my wife was, uh, she was also in a career move. So it worked out okay. I think that was, it worked out okay. So fast forward, we, we have uh, our first daughter, Jenna, when uh, I'm like 36 years old. And that was a, that was a real blessing. And Jenna's a, a normal kid, just, you know, bouncing off the walls at age two and a half in one, one weekend. Uh, she was very lethargic. And you think, well, it's just, you know, she's got a cold or a virus and she'll go to the pediatrician and find out. Um, and when we found out uh, what the problem was, she was uh, unfortunately diagnosed with high-risk leukemia. <sighs> uh, so that's at age two and a half. And so that turned our little world upside down uh, in, a, in a really big way. And anybody who's gone through anything themselves with a family member or a parent, uh, somewhere someone's gone through it, you have an idea what I'm talking about. This, and this, but this was you know, a, a child, a young child, and that's, that was really hard. Uh, because I, I, I felt like I was always, you know, needed to be, uh, you know, head of the household and protector, uh, you know, financially, but in all other regards and protect, you know, protect your children. And here I am, I'm at a loss. I mean, I mean, education, wisdom and money or real estate's not going to fix this problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we, we, we trucked on through that. It was, it was really tough for the next three years. Uh, Jenna survived it. Um, unfortunately, the marriage to her mom, who was a saint. Uh, or I should say an angel, really, uh, was her advocate all the way through. But you don't know what you don't know. And the stresses of all that, um, yeah. good yeah. news is we were able to continue on and, and co-parent very, very well. Uh, but I, 
you know, even then, I, looking back, I was still thinking, well, this is just an outlier. Uh, it was tough. Um, you know, I'm resolute. Um, I'll get back on my feet. I wasn't happy about the situation. I didn't, I didn't look at my life as being a fractured family. That was not on my goal sheet at all. Yeah. It's on no one's goal sheet. Uh, it, it happens, unfortunately. But you got to make the best of it in life. You make the best of the things that happen. And I think we did. Um, so I, I just put my head to the nose to the grindstone, spend as much time as I can with my daughter, even though she's you know, separated from me some distance, but still focused on her. And then she had subsequently epileptic seizures and the medication for seizures and the chemotherapy she had for treating leukemia uh, overcame her liver. And at age 12, she is in end stage liver failure. Wow. She's literally vomiting blood oh. because she's backing up. The liver's not processing anymore. It just backs up in the stomach and has to be expelled. So now she's on a liver transplant list, um, and that was, I, I still remember, I still remember clearly the, the, the day that we got the call, and, and anybody who's on a transplant list, you know, they tell the family and the, and the person have bags packed at all time in the car, because they have, they have volunteers who will, all over the country, that are, um, you know, angel flight um, volunteers who will fly you from wherever to wherever the, the medical center is. So, They've already got that set up. It's a, it's a great system, but you've got to be ready to go. Yes. There's no go home and pack up and no, no, right. you just go. And I was in my practice that day, and but I got, got the call. And so I head out and it, it, this was taking place in Houston. So Dallas to Houston, I had to make that flight. Um, and I just remember getting down there and it was so surreal because I knew that she needed this transplant, but then again, I didn't want to have her go through it yes. because the other side of this is, well, you know, how successful this is. This is major, major surgery. Um, and six hours later, the surgeon comes out and says, you know, it, we, we were, quote, successful. Uh, that doesn't mean you're done. It doesn't mean you walk out and everything's all good. Um, there's, there's complications. There's always complications. But that was the time, to see uh, that when I was in the hospital watching her fight for her life, she's breathing, she's hooked up to everything. This is right after the transplant. And that's when I really decided... I need to change some things in my life because I'm trying to balance all this stuff. I'm trying to you know, run a, a dental practice as a small business owner. Uh, I have this real estate on the side that had really kind of been building up, but I really hadn't taken accounting of it. And I just had to make a decision. And, and I decided then, and that was uh, 18 years ago, uh, I'm going to sell the dental practice. And some people say, well, is that what, was that a hard decision to make? And I said, not really, um, because my daughter. And I figured out there would be another day sometime, but I didn't know when that would be. I wasn't even looking at that. It's right, right now, focus on what I need to do. I did have enough real estate that I could buy myself some time. I didn't know how much time. I thought probably I'll go back to dentistry at some point. Got to get through this period of time where her life is on the line and I don't want to miss it. No. I don't want to have those regrets. Uh, so she did survive all that. So, and she just turned 30 last month. That's so, amazing. Wow. So, uh, so it's been, it's been a kind of a wild ride, but I, anybody who's gone through anything, you realize looking back that there's a lot of lessons that we learn. I think there's a lot of character building and all those iterations and me being out of the practice and focusing on my daughter and creating some margin in my life, you know, out of the dental practice, which I'd been doing for just a little over 20 years. It felt kind of good to say, Hey, I could take my foot off the pedal for a little bit but I know I'm not going to stay that way because I'm just not built to, to, to do that, right? <laughs> right. I mean, so, so at some point I'm going to get back in, but I didn't know what it was going to be. I didn't rush to get back in, but what happened was um, my, my, my lovely wife today, we've been married 15 years, Candace said, you know, uh, this was after Jenna had, had, had survived the liver transplant and uh, I decided to sell the practice. And so we, she said, we need to send, send a Christmas letter out to, to let people know, you know, good news. You know, Jenna survived and, and it was a P.S., Oh, by the way, you know, David sold his dental practice. That's all she said. Well, that call, call is coming in. Well, congratulations. So glad Jenna's doing well. But by the way, David, can I talk to you about the selling the dental practice? You're in your 40s. And financially, you know, that doesn't seem like it makes sense. What are you going to do? Yeah. And I just, that's when I opened the door and said, well, I'd, I'd always been investing in real estate on the side. I kept the two very separate. Yeah. They were not tied together. I did not have a dental real estate office combined. Yeah, right. Uh, right. Uh, not, not a good, not a good mix, right? And usually you don't hear that. No, no, it's, it's, yeah. it's a, well, it would be very, very, very unique if, if I had done that, but <laughs> yeah. I decided not to. Yeah, not why to go are you getting your road. teeth done? Do you mind looking at this house? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so I, 
so when they when people ask me how'd you do it, I I said, well, I could I could teach you how I did it, but I started when I was you know back in my twenties and I had more time than money and knowledge. I said I just kind of bootstrapped up the way. I said maybe you could just uh, piggyback on some of the deals that I do, and that's where Freedom Founders really originated back about 2010, a dozen years ago. That's how it re- it was very organic. So I didn't have this vision of Freedom Founders at all. I just I'm just helping a few people, yeah. uh, you know, to say here's how I do it, and you want to put some money in the deal with me? I'll we'll, I'll, I'll show you some splits we can do, and and that was about four or five people, uh, and we did a lot of deals that way. And then it's like more people are start, starting starting you know, come my way through the grapevine and well, could you, know, you help Dr. Joe, could you help me? And, and I started thinking, well, wait a minute, I gotta be careful. Um, Candace, my wife always says, be careful what you build because you may have to live with it, right? Yeah. So I thought, well, that's, that's good advice. So how can I help people? How can I be relevant to this night, kind of new marketplace? It's still my colleagues in dentistry, but instead of helping them with their practice or you know how to exit a practice, I could show them how to do that, certainly. But it's like, no, uh, how could we actually build some plan B wealth that's not correlated to the stock market? And that's what, that's what real yeah. estate essentially is. So that's why I thought, well, I, could, I, could, I don't want to build this business myself, but how could I create the synergy of people that I knew in my network and bring them kind of to the table, so to speak, and I'll be the translator. Yeah. I'll communicate. We have people that are boots on the ground, really good at doing real estate that I know around the country. Uh, they always need capital. Yes. Capital drives it, right? Yes. Uh, and I've got these dentists who say, hey, I want to get into real estate, but you know, either I've tried my hand at it, and uh, boy, that wasn't, that wasn't fun. Uh, tenants, uh, you know, contractors, uh, you know, it just wasn't a good fit. So maybe there's a better way. And so that's how Freedom Founders you know, initiated back then and, and where we've gone to today. Wow. How many people now are involved with this and um, how far does it expand in, in general? Well, we're, we're nationwide in the U.S. and we actually have some Canadian uh, docs that are with us. And, and we're, we're, for the most part, we're dentists. Uh, there are other affiliated uh, physicians, cardiologists, vets, but mostly dentists, not because it has to be that way. It's just that's where I came from. So that's who I talked to, right? Yeah. Uh, it would work for anybody, but just that's where we are. So we've got a little over 100 members uh and members are almost all couples there may be a couple single people that just aren't married but most are all couples and since we don't talk about clinical anything uh, the spouses actually enjoy it because we talk more about life yeah now they think it's going to be all about this real estate stuff and there is there is i mean that's 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 a pillar of what we do but what i try to teach them is Real estate, in this case, is just a vehicle. It's just a vehicle. There's many others out there. I just found one that works, and I figured out a way to scale it for other busy professionals if they so desire uh, and keep them safe, keep them from burning their time uh, and try to do too much. Because I think the the problem that many of us have, uh, I'll just speak for myself to see if it, I see you're nodding your head. Uh, we, we try to take on too much. Hello. Guilty. Right? Yeah. It's like, Guilty it's as like, charged I, so bad. I, I could do that and, and I could do that. And, you know, and we can't do it all. We certainly can't do it all very well. So I think showing the, the, the members that we have where they are in their life, how they can uh, build this non correlated wealth, but at the same time is showing their better halves. Um, and and that, that could go either way. We have female docs who are awesome. We have male docs. Uh, it, but showing the, the other side, you know, what, what's in it for them? Yeah. What's in it for their family? Uh, that's what I like to talk about. Again, real estate is a vehicle. But I say this is going to give you a, a, a more of a certainty in your financial plan so that you're able to take some time off, not someday when retirement comes, quote, which I hate that word, but whenever you, you know, decide you're going to pull the plug, uh, which for many it's you know not till their late fifties at the earliest, and many it's going to their sixties and even the seventies. It's 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 a hard uh, hard to do that today, and with the volatility in the marketplace yes. that we, we're seeing it right now, yes. yeah. that that gives a lot of uncertainty to a model that's been historically the default model. Put your money in a four hundred one k, and you know blah 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 blah. And I don't think that's going to pan out for the generations upcoming. I think everybody who really wants to have a a handle on their future financially and therefore their freedom. You have, I tell people, you have to be a little bit more active. Now, not active where you have to be a contractor and you know, and with real estate, you don't have to do it that far. But you're going to be more active and not abdicate your you know financial future to other well-meaning people, well-meaning financial advisors or sure. CPAs. They're all doing their best, but I just found that real estate is something that you can have more control over. Again, it's nothing's perfect, but 
if you do it the right way and find the right people, you can have more control. Well, and I like the idea so much of the vehicle piece because, you know, when your daughter was ill, it was a vehicle to time that you would never be able to get back with her. And so it had a slightly different meaning potentially than, you know, financial vehicle towards certain types of goals or different type of time off, you know, and I can resonating so much with what you're saying. Um, cause Kyle has really had to push me over the past year and a half, two years to remind me, um, the busyness, the calendar, the work is not the goal. Right. <laughs> like yeah. the work was supposed to be a vehicle to a big, amazing life. Yes. And you don't talk about what the life is supposed to look like anymore because everything is about the work, yeah. you know? And it's interesting because it seems to me you asked some really smart questions of yourself that I wish I would have thought of early. So for instance, you know, one of the things I heard you say is you said, well, I don't want to be the only one to build this or so how could I bring other people in? And just that alone, I'm like, wow, that would have been a good question for me to have asked a couple of years <laughs> yeah, ago yeah. about now how to not be the only one to figure it out. So why were you asking that kind of question? Like, why were you thinking beyond? Was it because of what happened with your daughter or is it something about how you're wired? It was really about my daughter's situation. And I realized that while dentistry was a great career, uh, no regrets at all, certainly it was a way to serve people and feel very satisfied in, in, in solving people's problems of the oral, oral, oral cavity, but I did not want to get tied down to something like that again. And so I just thought, you know, and, and I didn't do this by myself. I, I definitely collaborated with other people in other industries. I think that's one of the best things we can do when we're trying to figure things out. Don't do it solo. I mean, you, there's other smart people that you can uh, gain, gain some, glean some, some wisdom and some pers perspective. So but I just didn't want to think about I had to do it all. That's the, that's the normal mindset. Well, if I'm going to build this and I need to control it all and I need to have all the pieces in place and just the art of collaboration, which is something we certainly didn't learn in dental school. Have it's, they taught that in any school? No. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, Love that phrase. <laughs> well, well school, school, is, school is just uh, competitive. I mean, it's competitive to get into school. You know, the higher, it's very competitive. So yes. it's kind of a dog-eat-dog, -dog and you're, you're never taught to collaborate on anything. But life, you know, as we know it in business, the more you can find, and again, the key is the right people. So that's a you know, vetting process on its own. But, but finding the right people to collaborate with, you can build so much more. I know that's what you've done here with Marketing Blender. You've, you've talked about the people who, who, who entered the fray. Some people maybe on the, the outside at first, you know, uh, just uh, affiliates, joint venture partners, but sometimes then they decide to jump on board, whatever that is. All those different kinds of collaborations, I think, are the key to building uh, more success rather than trying to do it solo yourself. Yes. And too many people, I think, think, think well, yeah, but I'm going to give up too much. And I say, too much what? Oh, too much profit? Now, how about time? Get back to our point in the discussion today. What, what, are we, what are we building this for? We'll have freedom of time and flexibility. That's, that's what I want in my life. And, and I have to still watch that. I still have to watch it because I can start to derail sometimes. But fortunately, I, I have, and I'm blessed with a really, really good team that's over time allowed me to really get in my lane of what I really enjoy. And I think that's, that's the key for anybody, you know, who's self-employed, entrepreneur, business is, is you've got to build that team around you, right? And if you have the right people around you, then they can allow you to do the things that you do best. Because if you try to do it all, you're dilutive and yes. you're not going to ever be able to, to raise the bar to provide the value that we all want to provide for our, our clients, customers, patients, whatever it may be. I mean, that's, that's what gets me up every day, honestly. I, you know, people say, well, you know, you, you sound like you're passionate about this. I go, yeah, I am. I am. Because because I know that we have a way to change lives. Uh, some I can see it directly and some I know there's just a ripple effect uh, that we get back sometimes. But it's, it's, it's all good. And so that's my driver. Yeah. It's the scalability in any business. And, you, and you're doing it now, you know, with the real estate market and um, getting the right people behind you and you all are collaborating. But it's the same way as building the processes here with this company, getting the right people together and doing the same thing. Like she can't do it all. No, Are no you way. only going to get so big on your own? And that's um, when you, a person goes to look to invest in other companies, it's, hey, how, how scalable is it? Right. You know, what kind of process do you have behind it? 
the answer's none, not yet. We're going to figure it out. You're like, whoop, that breaks. Uh, that sounds like come I'm back buy- when um, you, you got, got to figure it out. out. Yeah. yeah. Sounds, like I, sounds like I'm buying a job. Yeah, yes. exactly. Which wasn't the idea. Yeah. <laughs> so why do you need me? Right. <laughs> Go to the bank. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, what do you hear from the doctors and dentists that you work with? You know, what is their other side? What is the thing that's happening? Is it burnout? Is it a loss of time or a God whisper that they ignored early on? I mean, what are the most common reasons where there's coming to Freedom Founders and saying, all right, David, I need something different or I need a new vehicle or some change in my life? I know at first, most people who come to Freedom Founders, are they're very skeptical, yeah. which, I, which I would be too. I acknowledge that right up front. I would be skeptical too. The words we hear, are, it sounds too good to be tr- true. And so, I, so we, we have ways to allow them to see inside and we get to check out both ways. But to answer your question, what are they looking for? Yeah, they're, they're looking for, I think, uh, a way out. Now, not necessarily a way out today, although many of them, I think, are in a place uh, across the board and you just pick healthcare as an industry. It's tough out there today. Yes, it's it is. very tough, up, uh, all ranks. Uh, it's the, the system is, is you know, driving the hardworking people, and we saw it during COVID, uh, the, the, those hard frontline people who stayed in there but it's 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 been tough, and so they're they're looking for is, is a way to, to to gain some freedom and 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 see a different out. Most of them again just look for running a career to the end point, whenever that might be. And the problem is they don't know what the end point is. Most of that's on financial uncertainty. Uh, we've got today the inflation factor, which we haven't seen in forty years. So now that's starting away with people. So I thought my nest egg of X was going to do it, and now my financial advisor says. I don't know, Bob. Uh, if you're still healthy enough, you might want to stay in the game a little bit longer. Ugh. Yeah, those uh, ratios of three percent every That's, year just went out. That the went out the window. Yeah, yeah. yeah. overnight. Yeah, and stock market went down. That went up. You know, if you're getting ready to retire, it went back to 08. You know, same thing. Everyone had to tap their brakes, spend a couple more years in the workforce That's right. till they could afford to get out of it. Yeah, and, and so and so uh, so they're 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 looking for a way to to have more certainty and 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 see that light at the end of the tunnel, uh, and I think that's I can relate to that. Even though I didn't have all those numbers figured out when I was leaving the practice, I just knew I had enough for a period of time. That's all I needed. So so, but I realized that these numbers will work, and so once they see it and they have the confidence, then it changes their entire mindset. And we have many docs who actually came to Freedom Founders because they were ready to exit. They just needed to make sure that they could can, uh, redeploy their capital and their equity into something that would give them the run rate, the, the cash flow uh, that they could see on out. But as some of them started to see that, it took the compression off of the, the, the hard driving they were having to do in their practices and let them change the model. A little bit like what we're talking about here by bringing other people in. Again, it's, it's, it seems dangerous to change a model that's at least got you to where you're, you're treading water. At least, at, least I'm, you know, at least I'm financially there, but I'm doing everything. I'm wearing all the hats. And I wouldn't dare, I'm just speaking for other dentists, I wouldn't dare think about bringing another doctor in because, well, I've, again, I've tried that before and it, it, it didn't work out. And Well, what, what usually works out in the first, first round anyway? Very few things. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but now they've got this runway. They've got this margin to say, you know what? Actually, I could ex- experiment or I say test. Just test some things. And I think it's the, the overall community. They see other people that are on the same path that are just like them in many ways but have already seen some results. And I think that social proof of results starts to change their mindset. And... And then we, we've got a big, big focus on the next generation. Um, we, we, ha- we allow them, we encourage them to bring their young adult kids, which could be, could be you know, 16 to 30, wide span, just so they could be exposed uh, to our, I call it our contrarian or renegade thinking I love uh, that. about life. But, and that's a whole other story about, you know, we could go into another, another rabbit hole. About, we, about, probably about, 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 <laughs> we probably will. We probably will. You know, buckle up here, right? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the whole education thing and, 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 and how kids are kind of getting railroaded by the system. And we just want to, like, open the doors, you know. Choose what you want to do in life, but, you know, how do you know 
when you're a young age, but, yes. I, yeah, I'm, but I'm starting to, to, I'm starting to, this is what we do, right? Yes. We start to, we start to yeah, <laughs> exactly. you have to like, okay, back, back here, David, back, back. <laughs> no, you're talking to the wrong people. We chase squirrels all day long. So the majority <laughs> of these dentists or doctors or whoever it may be who come to you, they are already ready to exit or what, what's the percentage of them that are still in the practice going, okay, I'm using this as an alternative way to allocate my assets towards the future and and build a plan now, say five, 10 years, I have an exit strategy. What's the ratio there? Yeah, we've got the entire spectrum now. Oh, now I would really? say, if, yeah, I'd say a few years ago, Kyle, we had um, probably the predominantly we had more that were on the, on the you know, end stage of their career. Maybe say within the last five years, some, mm. a few actually come to us after they've sold. That's, that's the minorities. Most are the, that category are, you know, the last few years, they, they just want to get the certainty. And so they go in and pull the trigger uh, and, and make the move. But in the last three, four, five years, we've actually had a number of younger docs, uh, late 30s, early 40s, mid 40s, still in kind of mid career where, where they're, they're not, most of them are not thinking about getting out. They would just like to, again, feel like they have a, a more f certain financial plan so that they can take some time off while their kids are at that age where they can enjoy them and not have that guilty feeling. Because as a small business owner, if you're not in there doing all the things that we feel like we have to do every day and we haven't really figured out processes and systems and, and it still rides all on us, if, you, if you're not in that business, the overhead continues on. We, we all feel that. You decide you want to take a vacation, and first couple of days of vacation are great. About midway through the vacation, you start sweating it. You start thinking about all the stuff that's piling up. And the last three days are just terrible, and your family hates you because you're, you're, the, you're the buzz kill for the whole week. It's like, why did we even yeah. do this? You, know? you broke I mean, the rule. You got on email. Exactly. You said you weren't going to do yeah. it. Then my phone started dinging. Yeah. It dinged, it dinged, it dinged. Oh, okay, I got to do it. It's Thursday. Couldn't make it a whole week. Yep. 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 We've heard that. I know. Uh, so um, now when people go to invest or become part of this group, is it a collaborative all money in and it's kind of dispersed out through different investment properties? Or do you kind of find the right people to get together in a small groups to invest in these properties? Or do you just mentor them kind of one-on-one? -on -one? If you need help, I'm here to help. What's that look like? That, that's a great question, Kyle. And what I decided early on is I did not want to be involved or have any bias toward where anybody invested their money. I wanted to bring the best of the best, different asset classes in real estate and different sponsors or managers uh, diverse around the country. Um, and I did not want to be uh, a, a typical type of an environment or platform would be where, yes, we might be pooling all the money and we might have some funds like freedom founder funds you know fund a b c and this one does this i just didn't want to get into that um okay. couple, couple i mean a couple reasons one the regulations really really uh, yeah. compliance is way up there and i thought i you know it's, it's again just something that friction i didn't want but secondly i really did not want to have a bias towards you know this fund over here they're paying a lot better you know commissions and so you know even if i thought i could not be biased in that direction. There's just a, there's a human nature. So we don't do that. So I'm a connector. Uh, okay. We are a connector. Freedom matters. We connect. We, we bring the, the best people in uh, for them to invest with, but we educate. Uh, and so educate and the mentorship is, you know, through a lot of training. Um, we just do a lot of training. And then we have veteran members who actually are also mentors, you know, trying to scale something so that, you know, I don't have to hold the hand of each person. It's been a process like anything, and over the years we've just, I think, we've made it really, really work well. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud of our team, proud of the other members who have elevated uh, and love giving back and serving. There's, there's, we talk about a lot of safety in our room. Um, it's you know, the caliber and character of people, members, uh, real estate people. It has to be high. It, I feel like my job is to be the guard at the door. That's definitely the reputation. It, 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 you know, it, ha it's it has just to be the quality of the room for sure. Because this this kind of thing, particularly financial, the wheels could come off so easily. We've seen that, especially when you're in a market turn or correction. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm of the age that I've been through a number. I know what that looks like. I don't want to be. Uh, I want to. I want to be last one standing. Uh, if, 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 the, if the only one, hopefully not the only one, but I want our, our group 
to whatever happens in the next couple of years uh, with the economy, recession, whatever it's going to be, uh, I want to be there and reputation still stands that, that, you know, we did it the right way. You know what I love too is like, you seem to be really tuned into the God whispers in your life. You know, I mean, from looking back when you were a kid, you know, realizing the changes you need to make in your life, but even how you built Freedom Founders around just trusting what you were feeling around I don't like that friction. I don't like the, con- you know, the position that that would put us in. And so explain your lane. You said, you know, um, my team has helped me find and stay in my highest and best use, basically, you know, just changing the wording a little bit. So what is that? Because it seems like you have a tuning fork that helps you go, all right, I'm staying in the value lane that I know I bring and I collaborate with people that align with that. So I, I think that's maybe a natural gifting. What, what's your lane? Yeah, my lane is really, I think, looking at other people's puzzles. And I call it, you know, your life, your business, all your kids, your family, pieces of a puzzle. And every, we all have one. Uh, and there's borders around it that we decide kind of what our non-negotiables are. And that's where I start with people. So I'm really good at looking over other people's shoulders uh, just through my own lens and experience and quickly can see, you know, if you move this piece here, 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 let's move it around this way uh, to help them get to the goal they want. And, of course, they have to define what that is. Now, I can't do that for myself. Uh, that would be a mess. <laughs> the mirror is a really <laughs> difficult viewpoint. Very much, very much. But but I've, but I've, I've learned just, I think, through my... My own, yeah, my own natural gifting is, is I love to solve problems. Yeah. I, I, whether it was in dentistry for many years, real estate I found was kind of an adjunct to that because real estate, just like any business, it's about solving problems. Uh, you, you solve financial problems. You, you solve uh, problems of, of, of owners or buyers and sellers. It, it, it's just it's fun. It's fun to be in that creative mode where you get to do that. And I, I am blessed to be able to do that with our members. So be on the forefront where I can be involved in that degree and then – I think the other piece is is, is content, uh, meaning the messaging, uh, bringing what I consider to be the truth to the problems and the conflicts people have, uh, not letting them go by mantras that they've been taught. Uh, and that they, I say me too, but but you know also old beliefs, right? Uh, passed down. This is the way you do this. This is the way you do this. And I like to shake that tree. Uh, on a regular basis and, you know, just using stories and uh, just, you know, wherever I am, I'm always looking, how can I take an example of what I'm seeing over here or hearing or, and and how can I tie that in and create some type of a uh, new focus or vision for the people who listen to me to say, ah, you know, you might be right about that. Just, I like to, uh, I guess I, I say it this way. I like to interfere in other people's lives if they'll allow me to do that. How's that? Oh my gosh, I can totally yeah. relate to this. <laughs> you know, modest way to say I, it. I, you know, I, I, you, you already know this about me that I believe the highest and best use of marketing is to be a conveyor of truth yes. and to shake people up and to really create change, not react to change and create alignment and resonance. And you are definitely masterful at that. I mean, like there's just something just so significant, you know, around your content and the conversations that you have and those relationships that you build and the words that you convey. It's definitely a master class in how to do it the right way. But this was the school of hard knocks. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't take any courses outside of my focus in science and all the basics in school. I was afraid to bad, bad way to look at life. I was afraid to. So I've had to learn to be a better communicator. You know, as a dentist, most people you know, go to the dentist and it's like, I wasn't even the chatty dentist. You know, some people say, well, this guy talks to me all the time. I wasn't even that guy. You know, I just, I just did my work. And so I had to learn how to get out of my head, left brain, and learn how to better communicate from right brain or from the heart. And that took some work. That was not an easy pivot, but I knew if I was going to be relevant or influential, to, to a marketplace, to what I do today, I had to learn that. So I had to work on that. It was, it, you know, it, it was stutter step, stutter step, you know, crash burn a few times. But, you know, that's how life is. I mean, if you're going to do something, anything, you know, first time you do it, you're probably not going to be that good at it. I mean, there are some people who are gifted in some areas, no question about it. But that was, that was not my gift. And I tell people today, look, if, if I can do this, I, I'm really an introvert. I am very introvert, except when I'm talking to people about subjects I like. Yeah, <laughs> and, and then and then I then I'm good. But put me in a in a place where people are just kind of uh, 
chit chat. It's just like I get bored really, really quickly and I got to move on. So yeah. I have to, for me, I have to find my tribe. And when I do that, then, then I'm good. I can, I can speak on the front of a stage, although I'd rather do what we're doing here today and have a, a closer conversation. But again, to get a message out, to be a conveyor of truth, you, you've, you've got to go beyond that. And I think that's a, that's a calling. I decide, okay, I've got to step up and do this to a point. Not about ego. It's just, you know, I just got to be that person. It's time to, to do get it. out of yeah. your own way. I hope people listening take that to heart because I kind of laugh where I'm like, hey, everybody, no matter what your role or title or anything in your life, you're going to have to communicate and influence for the rest of your life. You might as well start getting That's good right. at it today. That's right. <laughs> like, this part is not going in. For 20 years, <laughs> It's kind of hard to be a communicator when the other person can't really speak back <laughs> when you're working on their mouth the whole time. That is true. Yeah, yeah I know. Like, it's, yeah. you know, dental, that's not an easy place to improve communication really not, when no. the value exchange no, is not no, about no. communication. Remember, mm, mm, yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> you no know, good opportunities there. there so, no. yeah. Okay. I do want to go back and chase that squirrel about how you are encouraging the younger generation to come forward and learn learn on that. I just applaud that. We have always made it a real point to speak openly about finances, business finances, home at the kitchen table where the boys could hear because we want just that. Their minds. Yes. Yeah. And to be just hearing, I mean, even, yeah, we never had a point where we were like, oh, we hope they take the business on or we hope they follow the entrepreneurial pathway, but we did always want to influence think critically you know, don't just buy into a pre-structured pathway that you did not pave and, and, you know, for yourself and did not think about. So I love that. So what are you seeing and like, you know, what, like what's been the impetus and what's, what are you seeing with inviting that younger group in? For them, it's, it's been just eye opening. We get so much great feedback from those young people and their parents because the conversations they're having when they get back home again, or even during the meeting, uh, it's, it's, it's eyes wide open. And again, I think it's, it's, it's giving them permission to look at their future from multiple viewpoints, not just the one that kind of everybody says, well, this is what you need to do. You need to go from you know, high school, directly to college or vocational, or you need, you know, well, need to do what? Why? I, I think the best gift that young people today could do, irrespective of what they think they want to do, and I'm, whatever that is, if it's higher education, then go for it. But I would say, I would want every young person to be given the gift of, of taking a minimum of a year off, maybe two, and go apprentice or intern mm. with other businesses, business people you, that you have a contact with through your church, community, uh, whatever it might be. It could be Rotary, but there's opportunities with business people who are good at what they do and just go spend some time and maybe do some with, with the field that you may want to go into. But I would, I would vary it. That, I would say do stints of at least three months, maybe it's six months at a pop and just go learn. Don't worry about, you know, how much money you're making. Uh, by the way, if you, if you haven't taken on a school loan debt, you, know, you don't need that much money anyway at that point. It's after you take on that debt where you need the money. And that's where I think young people are getting trapped today. Uh, they're being kind of sold a myth that everybody everybody needs a, a, um, a college degree you know, and, and even do better. You've got it. That's not true. It's that's not, not true. true at all. And so I'm trying to pull it away. I mean, just look what's happened this week is, you know, the administration is essentially uh, giving, you know, handouts of, I think, $10,000 of school loan debt uh, off the books. See, I think that's so wrong. I mean, it, it just exacerbates the whole problem. Well, if I don't have to be responsible for making good choices in my life and if someone's going to always bail me out, well, we saw that during COVID. Bail out, bail out, bail out. Yep. So where's the responsibility come in? Uh, I, I think that that's going to just exacerbate the problem because the high tuition that schools are charging because the, they know that the government is giving loans to these kids and now they get bailed out. So we're just making the problem worse. And, and, and there's not enough truth being told to young people today. It's still expected. You, you need to go to school. And, 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 let's, and let's go to a school with a name. Let's, how about out of state? We, I mean, we just on. had a family reunion on her side, and there was um, one, two, about six uh, young adults. Some of them were entering college, right at college, and some were still in high school. And I said, um, you know, we need to talk about ROI on college. 
think about it before you go yes. in. What is that degree going to get you? How much is it going to pay for you? Pay you in the long run, and what kind of debt are you going to take on? Um, we we just had a kid go to a community college for two years. I, best thing he could have ever done. Well, a lot of it that had to do with COVID. He didn't want to sit in a dorm room and go right. online anyway. But besides the point, he chose to go the second year because he goes, "Oh my gosh, this is uh, under twelve hundred dollars a year." I get the same credits, exactly. and now he's going to University of Arkansas. He got a lot but, of life experience oh, yeah, in the yeah. meantime, it, too, it was, um, learning about it, money, which was amazing. So. But I think they need to start teaching this in high school to the kids. Um, the, the teachers, and I talked to him about that. I was like, so what are your teachers in high school? I know they're focused on the subject you're willing to learn. You want to go do that in college? Maybe, maybe not. And I go, do they ever talk to you about what it takes, how much it costs? And they're like, no. No, just go to school. You won. You got into right. so-and-so. Right. They don't talk about <laughs> after the fact. Well, and, you know, I mean, high schools have percentages of X amount of our, you know, high school graduates go to college. And so that's a problem, yeah. a fundamental problem, because they feel like that reflects positively. And I just heard the other day that there are more seats than there are butts in the higher education landscape. And so... All of these colleges have been expanding their blueprint and making massive capital investments yes. and fundraising, and there's not enough young people to go around for the amount of um, available education. So it's about to get worse, the messaging and marketing around you have to go to college. Ooh, it's a big yeah. industry. And, and I think I heard a stat that said that 58% of those who have gone to college, taken on some uh, student loan debt, don't have degrees. They they they, oh. they, they went part way in and, and left. Fifty eight percent. Oh my gosh! So Jeez. so you got to say oh. there's a there's a serious problem here. Yes. Yeah. And yet we still continue to aid and abet the same process that's not working. I I I, I believe that you know the the soft skills, communication, marketing, uh, negotiation, uh, leadership, those are the skills that one needs to focus on in tandem with whatever technical education one wants to achieve because the world changes so fast now even with you know the degrees that we got uh, I don't I don't use that at all anymore I mean it's gone it's gone nope. and, and it, so so once a once a student crosses that that line and, and gets the gets that diploma it's almost irrelevant within a short period of time now again I'm not saying they can't go into what they chose to go into, and, and they have to continue to, to iterate and, and, and pivot as technology and information and economy changes. But those skill sets are something that are not taught. And I think that's a big piece of what's missing, where I think if someone took a year or two off and just really found some great role models that could give them those life lessons while they're in a business, see how this thing works, understand more about finance, and, 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 and the fact that a lot of business owners, you know, didn't have to go to school to get that higher education. And yet they're still respected in the community. They still seem to have good lives. And hmm, maybe as a young person, I could look at that side and go, that, maybe that's a better way for me to go for now. You can always go back to school. You can always go back to school yes. and get the education in so many different ways if that's what you want to do. But why rush it? Why anchor yourself down with all this debt and still be kind of puzzled about what's what am I really passionate about? It, there should be some, I like how you said finance, finance, accounting, some type of that in college. You, should, you don't necessarily have to get a degree, but there should be some classes taught for everybody. If you're going to go start a business, you need to know this. Uh, don't learn it the hard way. Go ahead and get it done. In, in almost anything in life, you need to know these numbers, like investing in real estate, owning your home, owning multiple things, investing in your future. You've got to understand numbers to make it all work. <laughs> That's so true. And, you know, I mean, money is also a communication medium in a weird sort of a way, meaning it communicates the value you're bringing, yes. generally yes. speaking. I mean, there's some outliers where that's not totally true, but at least the perceived value. So that's also important to understand is money is flowing through your life and through the economy and through businesses because of a specific language and value exchange not that you don't deserve anything. You are not, you know, entitled to anything. It's about what you bring to the table and how you're going to invest in that. And it's not college. Like college is not your ticket that you just right. cash in and, you know, money comes back at you just because you sat there for a couple of years. So, yes. So what's the average member when they go to Freedom Founders 
what's their initial investment look like or their net worth or what 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 does this uh landscape look like i know it could be all over the place of course but um you you mentioned younger people are even starting to get into it dabble in their feet yeah i i always want to make sure that it is the right time because we're not for everybody yeah there's a way that I, I want to help everybody. We all do, right? And there's mm-hmm. ways we do help uh, people who are not ready for what we do. But yeah, there, there are some criteria that, that we look at. And some of it's objective, some of it's subjective. Uh, and there's a little bit of a range. But I would say if you, the ballpark it, uh, most have probably in the neighborhood of a million dollars of equity somewhere mm-hmm. that is deployable as an investment. And they may already be invested somewhere, but somewhere around a million dollars is is a good number. They certainly need to not have a high personal debt. A home mortgage is fine, but I don't want to see you know cars leased to the hilt and a bunch of other debt because that needs to be resolved first. So so I, I make sure that that they're in a good position. And sometimes the best thing I can tell someone is, love to have you, but not yet. Maybe maybe the business, the the practice in this case for for our doctors. As I talk to them and I find out, you know, there's just things there that they haven't done. They've either kind of put their head in the sand or, or looked away. And I just, I'll hook, I'll connect them with somebody who I know is good at helping them there. I say, let's get that fixed, you know, get your profitability up, get your revenue fixed, whatever it is. Or sometimes they even have a secondary practice that they thought would be a good move because, well, you know, more is better what we think. Right. And, and that secondary practice is, is, is kind of a loser and they're, you know, and they're just, I say, you know, Let's figure that out. Uh, probably, you know, and then come back and come back. So, yeah, they've got they've got to be a place where they're they're in pretty good shape with their current business. I'd never want to hold real estate out as some carrot that's going to solve yeah. the problems. It's not. It's yeah. an adjunct. It's a bolt on to their core, which which is their business. That's that's the engine. I tell that's the engine that drives everything. Until the day you're ready to take your foot off the pedal, uh, you need to focus on that. If that's running well enough, then you may be a good candidate for what we do in Freedom yeah. Founders. People use the word passive income as far as this goes. I, I mean, I don't necessarily agree with that. There's always work to yes. be done. Um, You're right. I, I, yeah. I, you I, hear I, YouTubers now, hey, want to make passive in. income? I'm like, whoa. I've never totally. really heard of such, but, um, <laughs> you know, who are we to all be signing up for? It's right. no risk, <laughs> passive income. Um, but anyways, I, I get what you're saying. Um, it, it, we, we made a, a big choice to purchase a, um, you know, an, an actual physical office about a year ago, the one we're in right now. And it was, um, okay, do we lease? Do we not? I'm sure you have those discussions yes. uh, with dentists. I don't know the ratio of leasing versus buying, but I can see it, especially ones uh, that we've gone to in the past and watching them grow. And I'm, sh- you know, that has to be part of their game too if they're going to stay in it for a while. That's um, for us. It's a good way to get into real estate. You know, if you're going to make those payments and you can afford to um, own it as well, then have at it. Yeah, it, it can be. It can be. Yeah. You know, depends upon yeah. location and, and yeah. some parts of the country. The real estate is just so high priced. Mm. Uh, by the time yeah. you put some of your your hard equity, your your, your capital in, uh, that takes away capital to to grow the business. So sometimes you know it makes sense to lease for a while. It depends. It's a it's yeah. a varied situation. But back to the passive income. You're right. There's uh, real passive income uh, on the level we're talking about is not truly passive. Uh, there is right. an active component, right? Yeah. So I, I just call it asset-based income, asset-based. Uh, somebody still has to manage the asset. Uh, and even if you have managers managing the asset, you still got to be in tune with what's going on there. So it's, uh, you know, fully active would be going out and, as I did when I was younger, finding properties and you know, fixing them up and having my hands in that when I was young. But, but I don't want to do that anymore. But I still have to be on the forefront of looking to see where a good placement of current capital would be in, in, in relative to the current marketplace, what's happening, uh, being able to hedge. We, we talk about that a lot. And I, and I think our members really appreciate that. It's not an area that they've studied in life at all. But when they start to see there are ways that you can not predict the future, but I'd say hedge the future. Uh, I think hedging uh, against uh, different different changes in the market is what we often you have to we have to do that in business. Yes. If, if we're not looking ahead to what may happen, you know, in the next six yeah. months, next several quarters, and realize that, gee, some of our clients, customers, patients may be dealing with some hard financial times. They may not be able to use our services at the level they've been using them. 
that may come into play. So how are we, you know, um, you know protecting? Not that that, uh, not that that we can protect against that happening, but you know, how do, can we make our, our businesses more resilient? Same thing in investments. You're looking to, to to say how can you make my how can you make your investment portfolio more resilient? And if you're a little bit more involved in it, then you can at least make some of those decisions and not just hope someone else is doing it for you. Yeah. I love it. I think that's just another example of like asking the right questions. You know, in the beginning, I mean, even just asking yourself, how do I build a more resilient portfolio, a more resilient life, more flexible life? I mean, just allowing yourself to ask good questions and not limit whether or not you know the answers right now just leads you to some interesting resources and people and ideas. So, all right, I'm going to take a very weird hard left for just a second. (laughs) I'm nervous. I know you should be. No, really. Okay, I want to know what you do for fun because you know we, we you know you are a hard driving, you know guy. I mean, you know you're telling the story about how when you were in high school and grade school you were like that, and you know you're studying real estate on the side, even you know in an aggressive um, university environment, et cetera, et cetera. What do you do for fun? Like, how do you just go? All right, this is this is me time. The big thing for me today and it has been for a lot of my life is I, I love to play tennis. I, I started playing when I was young and well that's one of the reasons I, I had to uh, mow lawns and sell greeting cards door to door. I wanted a better tennis racket yes. and, I wa- and, I, and I had to buy, purchase my own lessons from the, the college um, team people and ride my bike down the college and get my, get my lesson. Five bucks an hour back then by the way. Five bucks an hour is what I paid. Um, so, so tennis is what I love. Uh, I, I've done other sports as well uh, and I grew up skiing. I don't ski as much as I used to. I think I'm a little bit more uh, risk averse. Not that I, not that not that I'm afraid of my my ability because I'll, I'll keep it under control. But I'm afraid of so many other people swarming the slopes today. It's like driving, you know, around here in, in the metroplex. <laughs> right? It's like like you might be a good driver, but you don't know what's around you. No, so. you do not. <laughs> but but tennis, you know, the worst thing that's ever happened. You know, I've gotten hit by a tennis ball, and that that only hurts for a little while. You I, still have good knees. I, you know, I mean, fortunately. I, Fortunately, I still have good oh, knees. Okay. Yeah, I, you know, I, I have I have friends that you know played basketball really hard and maybe mm-hmm. ran also. Um, I didn't do either of those really hard. I did some of that, but I think that's been my blessing that my joints are still good at this point. So I can I can still go I can still go hard and I enjoy it. And then crazy thing, uh, I, I I've been watching this this new rage in pickleball. Right. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I was kind of like, I was kind of like, uh, you know, I'm not going there yet. You know, I, yeah. you know and you're like, I'm a tennis player. Yeah, I'm a people. tennis player. <laughs> but we had some, we had some friends, we had some friends. We were out in North Carolina a couple weeks ago, some good friends of ours, and they've been starting to play pickleball. So I told Candace, I said, all right, we're, we're just going to jump in because that's what they do. We're just going to go do it. There's no harm in that. Actually, she, pretty, she plays as well. Candace Ten, plays uh, some, not tennis. So actually, I think pickleball, she's going to enjoy that more because she just never wanted to work hard to get to that level. It just wasn't her thing. So we, we haven't enjoyed playing tennis together, but pickleball, you know, you can do it. It's, it's, it's yeah. not that hard to, to get to a level quickly where you can just enjoy it, um, yeah. you know. And so, so that um, – and, and we like to road bike. So uh, that's something we do together. And not so much here in Texas because, you know, when's a good time to do that? I guess in the fall, <laughs> maybe in the spring. But Very short periods but, of time, but, you're but, right. But the, the scenery and the roads, uh, we like to go to, to, like to Europe. We like to travel and road bike yes. in other countries. Oh, now, that's what's been fun for us. And yeah. we've, we've been curtailed on that the last couple of years, unfortunately, because of COVID. We've had several trips that we just bounced year to year to year and hoping that maybe this next year uh, things will open up enough where we can get back to that because that's a lot of fun. I like, I like to get out on a bike because I always, like I said, I, I grew up riding a bike. I rode my bike all over the, the, the 50,000 population town that we lived in and you know, it was safe back then. You know, and I, can, I could ride everywhere. There was nowhere I couldn't ride and it was a 10 speed when I got to that, that level. And I've always loved to road bike, just to get out there and, and just go. And we would just, you know, in Europe, go to Europe and ride these road bikes uh, on these trips. It was a lot of fun. That is yeah. awesome. Yeah, I, I remember as a kid, too. If, I mean, uh, you couldn't walk to your friend's house and they're a little bit farther out. You rode your bike. You just got on the uh, bike. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah um, I used to pound the pavement and run trail run for a while. And it's, it's finally caught up to me. But um, I always enjoyed mountain biking, too, why I did that. And now... I'm more into biking. I'm looking at a road bike now myself oh, yeah, yeah. just to, because um, yeah. it's a lot of weather it dictates mountain biking. If it's raining, don't want to mess do the it, right. Yeah. And with, you know, road bike, as long as it's not raining out. Well, I mean, I guess you could ride in the rain if you really, really wanted to. But um, the maniac drivers around here scare um, me. Back yeah. to your point yeah, about that. That's right. I rode my bike up here to the office. It's only, what, two and a half miles back to our 
um, house yeah. from here. And uh, it was really fun with the exception of feeling like on total edge because the drivers are out of control. And so there's bike lanes pretty much the entire two and a half miles. I think I only rode on them half the time because people were like over. I mean, they're Just swerving push, and texting. And I'm like, way over. Yeah, yeah. I was like, Oh my goodness. But it was, we are fortunate I loved being on the wheels. We are fortunate enough to have the Trinity trails here. Oh, that's um, great. Those. Yeah. That's yeah they're nice. great. That's I know. Nice. I'm just looking forward to yeah. being a little cooler and yeah. getting back out yeah. there. Yeah, yes. for sure. Exactly. Well, I love it. I just had to validate that you are not the guy that only sleeps three hours a no. night <laughs> like, I, and literally works seven days a week. I'm like, that can't be true. <laughs> I scrolled through your LinkedIn profile today and it, I read where you played tennis and that's what he's always enjoyed doing. I was like, oh, I know this answer. <laughs> I, I, I got this. Like, yeah. you had, you, Kyle, you came prepared. Everything was yeah, well, up your I, there, right? Not <laughs> usually and not really. I just uh, wanted to get an idea. I, you know. We haven't had a chance to sit down and talk before. I know you have with Daisy. A little bit. Yes, we have. Right. <laughs> yep. Okay. Well, when I, I should never say final question because you never know where it's going to lead to. But one question I do want to pose is, you know, as you look around at the world right now and just everything that people have been through the last couple of years, and especially with your foresight around helping people transition and have a new perspective, what advice would you give to people or just what encouragement either way, just in at large? As bad as COVID has been globally and a lot of people sick, a lot of people we've lost friends and family members. That's the, that's the big negative. I think the, the corollary on the positive is it's been a wake up call to a lot of people. It's kind of like my wake up call was with Jenna in the hospital where you're just kind of looking at how fast your life goes by you and how many missed opportunities there are because we are so driven and there's always, an, we, we think, we think there's always another day. And I realized that for a lot of our members, they had that same reflection because they, while it was a tough time and businesses were shut down, but many of them had their kids that were off at college come home during that period of time. Mm. They got that second chance and yeah. they talked about how much they enjoyed that. Or people just talked about how, how, Actually, the family was at home instead of everybody running around because there was kind of this lockdown mentality for you know a good number of months as we reflect back on those those months uh, a year or two ago, and I think that brought people back to a sense of what is this really about? Because again, I just speak for myself. Uh, for so many years of my life, I didn't know what it was all about. I thought it was just to drive, 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 build, build, build what you know who knows. And I think that that conscious um, decision about Maybe I should be more purposeful in what I'm doing. I don't, you know, I don't have to have bigger this and that. Uh, how can I have the life I want today and not somewhere down the road? So my advice to people would be to whatever your, your wake-up call was during COVID, whatever moments that you got to experience that were good moments, the good parts of that, uh, just maybe it was in your, your community or maybe it's your next-door neighbors who you never talked to because we're so busy and actually you had to, you were all home and you got to actually get to know them. Whatever it was, Focus on that part, you know, uh, be intentional. Uh, go back and reflect with, with your journal, journal it, put it down, but, but don't lose the essence of what you learned during that period or whatever, whenever you learn something, don't let those go. It's easy to do. It's easy to dis dismiss those times and say, oh yeah, that was great. That was nice. We caught up with so-and-so and I had spent some, spent some time with my, my son or my daughter or my grandkids, but you know, I'll get back to that. No, you, you may not get back to it. You have to be more intentional hard, hard thing for us as entrepreneurs to do. Yes. I will be the first to admit. Yes. I, I completely yeah. agree. Yeah. We, like I said before, uh, with our oldest son staying home, we enjoyed that so much. We got two more years yes. that yeah. we wouldn't have. And we're like, you know what? And we watched him grow um, as a person and just mature and um, had quality time. And it was like three years to us, you know. Oh, I've never and, been um, so thankful for teenagers in my life as during the <laughs> pandemic, you yeah, know, because was, uh, they're great. goofy and hilarious yeah. and they were not out driving and visiting right. their friends because they had to stay at home with us. And it was, yeah. yeah, amazing to get to go deeper, you know, during a really unusual time that we would probably not have had as much face time with them. So yeah, I love the idea of just holding on, you know, to those things that you learn. Love it. David, 
Thank you so much for joining us. This has been so ridiculously fun. Okay. How do people find you? You've got a lot of cool stuff out there. So we'll have all the links in the notes, but tell people how they can find you, follow you. What, what are you interested in right now? Well, Freedom Founders, which is freedomfounders.com on the web. I have a podcast that is called the Dentist Freedom Blueprint Podcast. You don't have to be a dentist. No, to you listen don't. To it's it. so good. I had I had they see you on it, and uh, we had a lot of fun. Just we so did today. So I like to bring a lot of interesting people to kind of shake things up. I've written a few books. Uh, they're on Amazon under my name. Uh, people can go there, and I do have a blog that's on a YouTube channel. You can find me. Dr. Phelps there. Something about Dr. Phelps, I think, is, is what it is. I don't, I'll have it in the show funny, notes. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> I uh, subscribe to that one, too, so it's easy for me to find. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. Well, thank you so yeah. much. And onward and upward, yeah. you guys. Thanks. If you enjoyed this episode of the Corporate Caffeine Podcast, please help us help you by subscribing. I also hope you'll find us on social media. You can follow me, Dacia Coffee, and my company, The Marketing Blender, by searching us on your favorite platform or checking out the show notes for the links. We bring this to you because we envision a business world full of meaning, connection, and prosperity for us all. Until next time, onward and upward.